good to see people. I just want to tell you what I was convinced of after last night was that the scripture, and I don't know where it's at, but it's in Psalms somewhere where it says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. And I want to tell you, being there last night, I just kept thinking to myself, I am so glad that all of these last 30 years and the 18 years before that, I was planted in the house of the Lord. Because it, what a difference it makes. And you need to be planted all the days of your life in the house of the Lord and your life will flourish. It won't always be perfect. It will be difficult sometimes. There will be seasons. There will be valleys. There will be low times and high times. There will be all of those things. But I'm telling you, church, you need the church more than the church needs you. I'm going to say that one more time because that's a powerful statement. You need the church more than the church needs you. And I only say that because sometimes um, churches, I mean, not our church, but sometimes churches, we, we make appeals to people. We're like, we need volunteers. We need your money. We need your time. We need your energy. We need you. We need you. We need you. But the reality is that's all true. We need you. We need your time. But as much as we need people, you need the church more than the church needs you. Because there is something about being planted in God's house that just, you know, the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Didn't say that the gates of hell weren't going to prevail against your business or your family. It said the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And so we need to be hidden and enveloped and, and enclosed with, and I don't mean enclosed in a, in a locked away sense, but just hidden and wrapped up in the house of God, in the church, in God's family, and uh, so that we can go out and live. That's not even on my notes today, so uh, I just, that's what was running through my mind as I was at that reunion last night. I'm just so thankful for God's house. I'm so thankful for the, the church of God, the family of God, and I believe in his promises that will flourish. And I just was, I was just happy that my life is flourishing and, and good and um, just doing good and sad to hear some of the other stories that were last night of people's struggle and, and uh, so, but uh, yeah, all right. So we're going to get into the word. We are, this is week three of a series called, it's funny because the whole series is called The Holy Spirit. And for the whole series, I've been talking about how it shouldn't be The Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's just Holy Spirit, right? Kind of, kind of funny. I did that. I made that mistake. Um, because we don't go around, we're, what, the, the idea is that we are trying to personify, we're trying to give the Holy Spirit a, a personhood. Because sometimes we treat the Holy Spirit like some mystical ball or some mystical spirit floating around the universe. And the Holy Spirit, maybe he is a ball sometimes. I don't know. Sometimes he's a dove and sometimes he's a flame and sometimes he's a, he's a wind. He can be all kinds of things, but he's a person. He has a personality. And we don't go around saying, you know, the God and the Jesus, but we go around saying the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and it should just be Holy Spirit because that's his name. He just has a middle name. I don't, God doesn't have a middle name. Jesus does. It's Christ. Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard God's middle name? Jesus's middle name? Jesus Christ. People say it out there in the, you know, in the world. They say that name. Holy Spirit has a middle name. Spirit. Holy Spirit. I'm just, whatever. All right. Um, we are in week three of a series on Holy Spirit. And uh, just want to remind you, first week we, we talked about who the Holy Spirit is and some of his attributes, that he has feelings, he has thoughts, he has uh, opinions, he has preferences, he has things, he, he feels things, he has thoughts towards you, he has a will, he wants certain things to happen, he's a teacher, he's, he's, he's not somewhere out there, but he's somewhere right here. That's what we talked about last week was that he comes and he lives on the inside of us. Where is God? He's in heaven. Where's Jesus? In heaven at the right hand of God the Father. Where's the Holy Spirit? In you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So wherever you go, if you've asked Holy Spirit into your life, right? We ask Jesus to come into our hearts, but really it's not Jesus who comes into our hearts. It's the Holy Spirit who comes and actually lives in our hearts. So when you're here today sitting, the Holy Spirit is here. Hopefully you felt his presence and you feel him. But can I tell you, the same Holy Spirit that is so powerful and prevalent here in a place of worship goes out those doors with you to your car, Amen. goes through your front door of your house, is there with you when you're on the couch eating chips and watching TV <laughs> or ice cream or all of the above right? He's with you when you're out on Saturday night. 
He's with you all the time. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He goes with you. And uh, he, and, and we talked in depth about that. You can, these are all on video and you can watch them on our YouTube channel if you want to catch up on the series. But here we are in week three. And today we're going to talk about the real gift of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does in our lives and why it's important to have the Holy Spirit. We're going to start in a scripture in Acts chapter one. And we're going to start in verse three. And we're going to read. All right. During the 40 days, we talked about this last week. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he was on earth for 40 days. During the 40 days, after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Verse 4, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And he replied in verse 7, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive, everyone say power. power. You will receive power in verse 8 when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8. You shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now remember, this is from last week. There's two experiences with the Holy Spirit that we believe. You receive the Holy Spirit. He comes to reside in you when you get saved. When you ask Jesus into your life. When you submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus. And you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. And you invite Jesus into your life. You receive the Holy Spirit. But there's a second work of the Holy Spirit. That happens sometime after salvation. And it can happen anytime after salvation. And for some of you, you've experienced it. Some of you haven't. It comes when you ask for it. You know, there's no waiting period. There's no, there's no waiting time. You can get baptized in the Holy Spirit on the same day that you get saved. Or some of you, maybe you've been saved for 20 years and you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can get baptized in the Holy Spirit today, 20 years later. Okay, so it's talking about, we're talking about the second expression because he's already, these, he's talking to his disciples who have already received the Holy Spirit because they're already saved. We talked about this a lot last week, so you're going to want to watch that if you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, they already have been saved, but he says, I want you to wait here in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere else until you receive the Holy Spirit. And he said, when you do, you're going to receive power. And power is what we're going to be talking about today. Notice that he didn't say, and you will start speaking in tongues when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. That was not the emphasis in this moment. He said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He didn't say, you're going to be able to do miraculous things when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He said, you're going to receive power power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. See, I believe, I've grown up my whole life, I've been in Pentecostal or charismatic churches. I grew up from a little girl, like three years old, four years old, all the time in a church that believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I believe, this is just my own personal experience, and it's limited to my perspective and everything that as a kid I took in. But I believe that charismatics have often overemphasized the speaking in tongues part, okay, and the, the supernatural part, and have overemphasized that and de-emphasized the power that's supposed to come from being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We've over-spiritualized it because, well, I won't get into because, because I could just really step on some toes and I don't want to do that, but... He didn't say, and what I'm trying to point out is that he didn't say, I'm going to come and you're going to have this weird language to speak. I'm, I'm going to come and you're going to do all these things. He said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and you're going to receive power, okay? And uh, tongues is the evidence of that gift. It's the evidence that you've, you've got it. We believe everywhere in scripture where they received the gift or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. Okay? And that's what we believe. That's what we read. We read these scriptures last week. So that's that. See, here's the thing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and all of the above. You just have to decide what you're going to do with it because it's in scripture. And so lots of denominations, lots of churches, they've, they've come up with explanations for it. 
And some believe in it, some don't believe in it, and you just have to decide. And so you as a Christian, as a believer, you have to decide what you're going to do with it. Now, my dad used to always say, um, he'd take a Bible and he's like, when you don't, you can't as a Christian just go through the Bible and the pages you don't like, just rip those pages out. Right? You, you, don't, you, have, to, you have to explain it. You have, to, you have to figure it out. You have to, one way or another, reconcile yourself to what the Scripture is saying because we believe Scripture is absolute truth. If it's absolute truth, then I have to come into alignment with that, and I've got to figure it out. And there's, you, you can do what you want. Again, remember, we're going to stay focused on the things that unite us. And we are united in the fact that Jesus is Lord. There is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved. So salvation comes through no other name. It's Jesus. Okay? So whether or not you speak in tongues or not, it's fine. We're all going to be able to be great. But you have to decide what you're—I'm presenting Scripture. I'm presenting our case. I'm presenting what we believe. And you have to decide what you're going to do with that. All right? And we love you whether you speak in tongues or you don't speak in tongues. That you need to, and that's why we're doing this. We're bringing attention to it. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's maybe creates some tension inside of your life, but that's good. It's good. We want to invite the Holy Spirit to the conversation. We want to invite him to the table because I think he'll do some amazing things in our life. All right. Um, tongues are important. They are the vehicle or the channel by which we access the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about the, t- act- I know I've been saying we're going to talk about it next week. And then I said it the next week. We're actually going to talk about it next week, okay? Which is the last week of the series. So we will be talking about tongues, what they are, different kinds of tongues, what they're function for, all of that stuff. But today we're talking about power. And uh, you notice that the, the key point here is that he didn't say, well, you stay in Jerusalem and you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you're going to receive tongues. He said, you're going to receive power. All right? That's the key element here. Now, we're going to talk about power a little bit. I have here a $20 bill. Y'all see, it's not fake. It's the real deal. And um, you know that this $20 bill is just really a piece of paper or maybe fabric. I don't know. They, it's weird what they, how they do this. But it's just really a piece of paper. And, and the worth of the paper, the actual worth of this piece of paper is not very much. Right? Like, I don't know, what's a piece of paper? A fraction of a cent maybe? I don't know. Right? But it's, it's a, just a fraction of a cent. And you could pile hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these together. And it still wouldn't be worth very much money. In the material. Right? But yet we all understand that the value is not in the material of it. It's in what it has the power to do, right? So while this piece of paper isn't worth very much, none of you would want me just to rip it in half, would you? You'd be like, no, don't rip it in half. Give it to me at least. Like, don't do that. You wouldn't want me to put it on fire. Imagine if it was a $100 bill. That would be even more excruciating to watch someone rip it or burn it or crumple it up and throw it away. If you saw someone do this and then throw it in the garbage, wouldn't you be the person that was like, hey, before I leave today, I'm going to go back to that garbage can and still see if it's there? Wouldn't you? Because while this doesn't have much worth in it as a piece of paper, we all know that it has great, great worth. It's the value of the purchasing power that it gives us, right? And so money is simply the tool. It's not the money itself that is powerful. It's what money can do for you and to purchase things. And that's um, very similar. That's what speaking in tongues is like. It's not the speaking in tongues itself that is powerful. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit that's inside of you that gives you the power. And what we've done oftentimes is charismania is we have overemphasized the speaking in tongues and de-emphasized the actual power that the Holy Spirit can give you. Does that make sense? Tongues are just the conduit. See, money is just the conduit. Money really doesn't mean anything. Money is completely useless sitting in your wallet. Now, personally, it makes me feel good, so I like knowing that I've got money in my wallet, right? How many of you like knowing you got some money in your wallet? But it's absolutely worthless sitting there. I could have bundles of these, stacks of these, sitting under my bed or in my couch or in my garage somewhere hidden or dug out in the, in the lawn. It is absolutely worthless as long as it's sitting there. But I'll tell you what, I dig that thing out and I take it down to, Costco, like that's one of my favorite places to go. How many of you like shopping at Costco? I said famous last words the other day. I'm like, I'm just running in. I'm getting coffee and something else. Two items. 
You know, I'm checking out and I'm like, yeah, $200 later, it's a whole cart, a cart full of stuff I didn't need, but my mom is here. So we had to have like, you know, those little chocolate cakes that they've got right now, you know, so we've got to have that and we've got to have, you know, it's all her fault. It's all her fault. But I could have stacks of that. And that's how the Holy Spirit is. We can have the Holy Spirit. But if we don't understand the power that it produces on the inside of us, if it's just sitting dormant in our lives, if we're not accessing it, if we're not developing it, if we're not using it, then it's really meaningless and it doesn't do a whole lot. And that's where I find a whole lot of Christians live. They live at that address where we have the Holy Spirit, but we just don't understand or value its purchasing power. And I don't mean purchasing power in the sense of, you know, commerce. I just mean what the Holy Spirit can and does do for us. So we're going to look at this concept of power. Um, It says you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you. Let's define power. And this is a powerful definition. Okay? Listen to this. Power is the capacity, the ability to direct or influence the behavior of oneself or others or the course of a desired outcome. I'm going to read it again a couple times because this is really powerful. Power is the ability to direct or influence the behavior of oneself or others or the course of a desired outcome. How many of you would like to have the power to direct the course of an outcome? How many of you would like to have the, the power to, to direct the course of your spouse? Yes. Yeah. How many of you would like the power to direct the course of yourself? How many of you would just like the power to say no to the chocolate cake? How many would just like the power to say no to the ice cream or the chips or the... Or how many would just like the power to get up off the couch and get yourself to the gym and do that stupid treadmill or that elliptical, right? That's what power is. And we're going to talk about this. Um, It's the capacity to direct or influence the outcomes in your life. And the Bible tells us that when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive power. Now, we have a pretty good understanding of what power is. Let's talk about physical power, the ability to, to, to lift or to move things. In my body, I'm, I, I'm able to, I saw Ox bringing out this today. He was able to bring this from wherever it was. We couldn't find it. It was missing. But he found it, and he found it, and he brought it out here. That's physical power. We have the ability to clean our homes and wash our cars and wash our clothes and, and get up and go to work and, and do things because of physical power. We all understand that. But how much more do I love equipment power? How, much, how many of you would rather cut a tree down with a chainsaw than with a handsaw, (laughs) right? We like equipment power. How many of you would rather write an essay, a a 20-page essay on a computer instead of physical power with a a pen and paper, right? (laughs) Like, some of you are like, it definitely would have to write it out because you don't know how to use the computer, but that's all right. We'll forgive you. There's natural power. There's wind. There's steam. There's water, coal, wood, gas. There's natural things, right? There's social power, There's social power, the ability to influence others. There's political power, hello, the ability to determine laws and enforce them and corrupt them and do all kinds of things. There's financial power, the ability to buy things, the ability to to move in that realm, right? And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So what does it mean exactly when Jesus tells us that we will receive power? What is he talking about? Is it political power? Is it financial? Is it social? It's interesting because the disciples were on the same track. If you notice, we're going we're gonna to go back to it. But Jesus is there and he's been there for 40 days and he's giving them his final instructions. And it's in this, we've just read it. It's in Acts chapter 1. He's saying, don't leave here until the Holy Spirit. And in verse 6, so they're thinking, okay... This is what we've been waiting for. And in verse 6, they say, So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him. They kept, it wasn't like they asked him one time. This was on their mind. This was their concern. This was what was, what was dominating their thoughts. It says, okay, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? 
Okay, so you're talking about this. You, you died. We weren't expecting that whole thing, but you came back to life. That's pretty cool. So now, now is the time. Because remember, for generations, they've been waiting for a Messiah who was going to come and was going to restore order and was going to free them and was going to deliver them and do all of the things. And so they're like, surely now's the time. Remember how probably devastated they were when he died on the cross because they're thinking, you were our hope and you haven't done anything yet. You haven't said anything right. And so now he's getting them in this team huddle and he's giving them the final instructions. And so surely they're like, this is it. He's going to do it. This is, the, this is the moment. And he comes back with this answer. It's so disappointing. If I were there, they're thinking in terms of political power. And he actually kind of rebukes them and says, hey, just kind of like, don't worry about that. He's saying, it's not up to us to know. That's up to the Father. Like, why are you worried about that thing? That's God's deal, and he's going to deal with that on his own time. You guys need not to worry about all that. How many of you have a tendency to worry about political things right now, what's going on in our world? There's, there's reason for concern. Some of you are on high alert. Some, like, there's lots of hot topics and hot buttons. That's the world. Not much has changed in, since Jesus' time. Same world we live in. Very similar to what we're going through now, right? Except, you know, we aren't beheaded and stoned to death in the public square and hung and boiled in oil. So, you know, like we have it a little bit better, (laughs) right? But we're living in the same kind of environment. And Jesus is like, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. He said, that's not, that's not the important thing. He said, that's up to my father, and that's not what I want you to be about. So he's not referring to political power. Jesus is talking about a supernatural, a spiritual, a divine power that he wants to send to all the believers, to all the people, to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is a different kingdom. This is a different system than anything you've experienced. And I don't want you to get off to the left or to the right and be worried about the Romans and be worried about the Pharisees and be worried about all the different things that are going on that you can see with your natural eyes. I'm getting ready to send you the Holy Spirit who's going to give you a spiritual, divine, supernatural, inner working power that's going to come and it's going to infiltrate you. It's going to fill you. It's going to baptize you with fire. Remember the fire and the wind that we read about last week. And it's something that's going to come in and it's going to transform your life. And it's going to bring the kingdom of God from heaven down to earth. Amen. That's the power that he's talking about. Several times he says in the New Testament throughout his teaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's what he's doing. He didn't come to rescue the Israelites from the rule of the Roman Empire. In fact, the, Roman rule, the Romans actually destroyed them. Destroyed their temple. Remember all that? It went really bad. How devastating if you thought Jesus was coming to just fix all the, little, all the things going on in the world. Jesus came to fix people. The inside of us. And it's irrelevant of what's going on in the world around us. So there are several purposes for the power that the Holy Spirit gives us. Of course, we have the gifts of the Spirit. So you read about these in 1 Corinthians. There are gifts of faith and prophecy. And there are healings and miracles and and words of knowledge and words of wisdom. And there's all of these wonderful blessings that come. That's part of the power. And then there's the fruit of the Spirit, which is probably more important. You know, that we could walk in love. Joy and peace, you know, some of those things. Self control. Self control. Yeah, we get excited about that one, right? So today we're talking specifically about the power to live a godly life. I want you to look at this, this scripture in 2 Peter 1. It says this By his divine what? By his divine power, okay? God has given us everything we need. For living a godly life. We're going to pause there for a moment because I want us all to read that again. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Do you think he meant everything? Everything we need to live a godly life here on this earth, God has provided through his divine power. We have received this, all of this, by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. 
These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. And friends, I believe he's talking about the Holy Spirit when he's talking about his divine power and his divine power to come and help us live godly, holy Christian lives. Separated from the world. He calls us to come out, to be separate, to live godly lives. Do you know that we live a different life than the world lives? Okay, do you know that we're supposed to? (laughs) Sometimes my life looks a little bit like, you know, the world's life. Because sometimes I mess up or my attitude is really bad at certain retail stores. I don't know why. I just have such a bad attitude. But he's given me everything I need to live a holy, godly life. Everything about God's kingdom is completely opposite and contrary to this earthly kingdom. You've got to understand this. Like, God makes no sense. He, like, took how the world does everything. He flipped it upside down and says, we're going to do it this way. Entirely different, right? So he says things like, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, be the least. Be the servant of all. What? What? No, if I want to be great, I want to be the CEO. I want to be on top. I want to have the reserved parking space, and I want to have all the perks, and I want the office with the window, and I want, and and that's to be great in the kingdom. And he says, no, no, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you learn to be the servant. You give up the things. You prefer other people over yourself. You humble yourself in front of everyone, right? He says things like, love your enemies, I'm not going to love my enemies. I'm going to punch them in the face. I'm going to trip them up. I'm going to hurt them. I'm going to do everything I can to destroy them. They're my enemy. They don't like me. They're hurting me. They're saying bad things about me. Well, I can say bad things about them. They don't deserve my love. And yet Jesus says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. So they get to talk all kinds of trash talk, and I have to be like, Oh, Lord, just bless them. God bless you. And I've done that before, but not in like a really godly sense. I'm like kind of in a snarky, sarcastic sense. Like, oh, the Lord bless you, you know? (laughs) No, I think God what means like really bless those who curse you. He says, forgive those who hurt you. Isn't that hard? And isn't that contrary to everything we're told to do? If you want to find your life, you have to lose it. What does that even mean? How do you lose your life? If you want to find your life, you got to lose your life, right? Consider it pure joy when you face trials of all kinds. (laughs) What? It makes no sense. Be anxious for nothing. Have you turned on the news? And he tells me to be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about tomorrow. Well, does he not know that I have a bill due tomorrow? And if I don't pay that bill, they're like going to come and take away my kids? Now, that would be... No, okay. (laughs) Don't worry about tomorrow. Does he not know what's happening tomorrow? Does he not know that I have that doctor's appointment where I'm going to get the test results of that thing? And he says not to worry about it? What kind of kingdom is this? He says, be holy just as God is holy. How can I do that? How can I be holy like God? God is like perfect. I am not. And yet he tells me to. He says, husbands, love your wives. Like, what? Wives, submit to your husbands. Like, what? Do you know how idiotic sometimes my husband's ideas are? Mm, Children, obey your parents. Right? Be a generous giver. The list goes on and 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 on. The idea is that the kingdom, God took what the world does, he turned it upside down and says, we're going to do it completely opposite. What you think you're supposed to do, we're going to turn that upside down. And that's why we renew our minds and we have to come into alignment with scripture. And we have to learn a whole new way of kingdom living. But that's what he says. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive 
power. And in that power comes everything you need to live a godly life. So what he's saying is you are without excuse to do the things he asks of us because he has sent us a helper. He has sent us the Holy Spirit and he lives on the inside of us and he goes with us and he's in front of us and behind us like the song said that he would go before us and behind us and all around us and everywhere we go. God is, goes with us and we are we have power to live a godly life. Can I get an amen? amen? He says, don't worry, I'm sending you a gift. It's the Holy Spirit. And you're going to receive power when he comes into your life. And he's going to help you live out that life that I'm calling you to. And so now here we are, 2,000 something years later. And our mission at Family Worship Center is to, to lead all people to that successful, that faithful Christian life. And we believe that we can. We believe that we will. We believe we're doing it. Why? Because we've got the power of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of you and it lives on the inside of me and it lives here in this church and the people of this church and we've got power to live a successful godly holy Christian life amen now one of the things I've always struggled with I, I alluded to this earlier as a teenager and as a young adult growing up in I call it charismania because there was a lot of crazy like things. I don't know. I grew up in an experience where people rolled on the pews and um, fell on the ground and uh, there was a lot of this going on. I shouldn't do that because my arms shake, but there was a lot of this going on. <laughs> Some people call this jazz hands. I grew up and it was like Holy Spirit, like something going on with the Holy... Anyone else experienced what I'm talking about? You saw these things and you saw and there was people laughing and people crying and people dancing going on and da dancing all around and, and it, I grew up in that and, and that's fine. I, I, I'm not saying any of that's wrong or bad or, or, or what, but what I despised about it as I grew up was watching these people who are baptized with this power. The Bible says you'll receive power and it says that you have power to live a godly life and I'm watching these people and not all of them, but some, many of them I would say, but I'm watching their lives and at church they're like, you know, oh, shaking, laughing, crying, all these things, but they leave church and they're broke, they're depressed, they're negative, they're down and out, they have no money, they, they're sick, they're just all of these things and they're broken. It's like, okay, well, where's the disconnect? Because the scriptures I'm reading are talking about the power to live a godly life, the power to, to do all of these things, and yet these people seem absolutely powerless, except to come to church and shake a little bit and fall down a little bit. See, to me, it's awesome that, you know, if per, per, we call falling down, in, by the way, being slain in the spirit. Some of you have seen it. Some of you haven't. I don't know what your experience is with it. And I think that's fantastic if God does that. The, the idea being that the power of God comes on upon a person so much that they would fall out under that power because they can't physically stand up. Okay? And I think that's great. I believe in it. I have no problem with it. Except what I'm more interested in is when you get up and stand up, how is your life different? Like, if the Holy Spirit's going to knock me out and deal with me, I'm going to be changed. I'm going to come up different. What did you think? But that's not what I experienced. I experienced a lot of, like, because we can, we can manufacture some things. And in our church, one of the things is we're going to be a spirit-filled Pentecostal church, but I don't want to try to manufacture or try to, to make up a move of the spirit. I don't want to appear spiritual. I don't want to have people falling out. Like, I could push a person down. Right. And you guys could comply. And, and friends, I don't think that's outside of what happens in charismania. Okay? I think there's some manufactured things that happen because it appears spiritual. And I've seen some tongues and in interpretation. I, I've seen some real misuses of things because it makes us feel power. And that's what I want to say. God didn't say, I'm going to come give you the Holy Spirit so that you can speak in tongues or you can shake your hands in worship or fall out under the power. He said, I'm going to give you power. And that power is going to enable you to live a godly life. So I don't care how much you speak in tongues or how many tongues and interpretations you give or how often you prophesy or all of the things that you can do. What matters most to me is are you living a godly life? Is your life measuring up to the standard of God's word? Because that's really, at the end of it, I don't think God, we're going to stand in front of God and he's going to say, how many tongues and interpretations did you give? How many times were you slain in the spirit? He's going to say, what did you do with my word? What did you do with your salvation? What did you do with the things I asked you to do? Does that make sense to you? One of the things that I, 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 I don't, I don't, regret, regret is the wrong word, but I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was eight years old. I remember it. It was a Wednesday night at church, and uh, we'd been, must have been, I don't know, I don't 
know why there was a hunger in me, but I remember being down in the basement at Hillcrest Assembly on like 8th and Vanita in Bremerton, and I was in my missionettes class on a Wednesday night, eight years old, and for some reason, I went up to the adult, to the sanctuary where the adults were after church, and I just walked up to the altar where the pastor was, and I said, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. And you know what? He prayed for me and I received the Holy Spirit. I started speaking in tongues and it was just like no big deal. And that's awesome. I don't regret that. I, I, so I have never lived without the Holy Spirit in my life Amen. because I've never walked away. So at eight years old, I received the Holy Spirit and I just never walked away. I just kept the Holy Spirit in my life. Okay? So what I mean when I say I regret that, I don't regret it. It's just I never have experienced life without the Holy Spirit. Before that, right? So some people, I could ask people in this room, what was it like for you after you received the Holy Spirit? And you could tell me. You say, well, before it was like this, and now then it was like this. And I can't tell you that because I didn't really, like, I don't remember what it was like to be eight. I guess when I was eight, you know, I was, I don't know, what are you? I was eight. And then after I was eight, but I was full of the Holy Spirit. Like, you know, I like hadn't lived too much life. I didn't know the difference. And I, I don't regret that. No, I am so grateful for that heritage. I am so grateful that that happened to me. But you know what I mean? I'm, I, I can't explain to you what it feels like before and then what it feels like after. How many of you could though? How many of you could put into some words what it was like before and then what it was like after? Okay, so if you don't know, if you've not received it, if you've not experienced it, you might want to talk to some people who could tell you what the difference it made in your life. But it is a gift that he gives you, and it is um, a gift so that you can have power, all right? He wants to lead us into victory and prosperity. He wants to give us the power, as I defined it, to direct or to... to influence the outcomes of your life, the outcomes of your personal behavior, the behavior of others. How many of you believe you can pray and you can seek God on behalf of another person, that he would change their hearts, that he would change and soften their path, that he would put them on? How many of you do that? You pray for maybe a prodigal son or a daughter or someone who's not on the right path. How many of you believe that there's power in that prayer? And that's the kind of thing. I don't think God is as much concerned about how spiritual you get at church and the, the shaking of your hands and how much you laugh or roll on the pews. Or I don't think any of that stuff is necessarily wrong, but I think God is much more concerned with the outcomes of people, of his children, of his prodigals, of the people. How many of you want power that when the doctor comes in and says, you know what, you've got cancer at stage four and you've got three months to live and there's a power that rises up on the inside of you that says, I can handle this, I'm going to tackle this, me and my God, whatever the outcome is where I'm more than an overcomer rather than having to just buckle to the news and be like devastated and hopeless and just destroyed no he comes to have power for real life things if you are ever slain in the spirit if you are ever in any of those circumstances that's great that's fantastic I believe that's like maybe some sugar you know in the frosting or, or the, the cherry on the sundae or the, the little, little extra touch but I'm telling you that the, the power of the Holy Spirit has come so that you can live a godly life that you can change the outcomes of certain things in your life that you are not just a victim that's going to just be just dictated by every circumstance no you are an overcomer you take control you take power. You take authority over those situations in your life and the power of the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you to direct your steps and to say, yes, we've got this. We're going to do this. We're going to tackle it. Come hell or high water, come better or worse, richer or poorer, life or death, all of these things, we're going to make it. And that's what the Holy Spirit's role is in our lives is to give you power, not to be cr like all of those other things. Amen. Second Timothy 1. It said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times for people will be, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. In verse 5, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. And he says, stay away from people like that. See, they will act religious, but they'll reject the power. 
the power for what? That could make them godly. And church, we don't want to be those people. And many of us, we read that verse in 2 Timothy, we're like, oh, we're, yeah, people are so bad. They're slanderers, and they're disrespectful, and they disobey, and they're all these things. But I'll tell you what, there's a piece of that that maybe resonates in me, that sometimes maybe I act religious, but I deny or reject the power that could really make me godly. And friends, let's not be that church. Let's not be those people of God who talk a good game, and we show up for church, and we go through the motions, and we, we do the things, and we act religious. But we reject the power. Let's not reject what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in this season. Let's not reject what the Holy Spirit's trying to do in this series. Let's not reject what the Holy Spirit's trying to do in your life, in your family, in your personhood. And let me just tell you, some of you, you got to get over some of the, the insecurity and the, the, the fear, the unknown, the uncertainty of what this Holy Spirit thing is because you've seen some crazy things or you, you don't know or you, you don't want to be wrong or you're just afraid or timid. I'm telling you, you can trust the Holy Spirit. And we need to lean into him because he's there on the inside of us to lead us and to guide us, to teach us, to counsel, to comfort, to lead us into all truth and to give us power that we could live a godly life. Acts 7 51 says, you stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Let's not be people who resist the Holy Spirit. Let's be people who say, yes, Holy Spirit, come. Fill me. Baptize me with your holy fire. Wouldn't it be cool to see tongues of fire on our heads? I don't know. That might be like weird. <laughs> We'd probably have our security team like, uh, we got fire in the sanctuary. We need some ushers to come down. <laughs> I don't know how God was. Here's been my prayer. I believe the Holy Spirit in these last days is going to be poured out like we've never seen before. And here's what I keep telling the Holy Spirit. Because honestly, in my life, I think I've um, probably quenched the Holy Spirit. In, in my life and, and even in the church because I didn't want a repeat of what I experienced growing up. It's like, I, I don't want just to be charismatic for the sake of being charismatic. I don't want to just go through motions so that it appears good, you know, and whatever. I want like, I want to be the real thing. <laughs> And I believe the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. The Bible tells us on, in the last days, it's going to be poured out on all flesh and people are going to be prophesying. There's going to be all of this thing. And I want to be right in the middle of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And I don't want to try and manufacture it based on my past experience. Like, oh, this is what the Holy Spirit. No, I want men and women full of the Holy Spirit, living victorious lives, the best that they can. Nothing perfect. I'm not talking about perfect lives. I'm just talking about power. Like, we're not victims. Like, we're the, we're the body of Christ. We're soldiers. We're the army of God. We're rising up. We're being a voice. We're taking the gospel to the streets. We're making a difference. We're living out our purpose. These are the things that the Holy Spirit comes to give you power to be able to do. We are not victims sitting by and just, oh, I'm so mad at the government. Can you believe what he's doing? Can you believe what's happening? Can you believe that they passed this? Can you believe? That, like, that's so irrelevant to the kingdom of God because he is so much bigger than that. The kingdom of God is at hand, people, and the Holy Spirit's been poured out and he's on the inside of us and he's given us power so that we can go live big, powerful, purposeful lives and not shrink back and be upset about everything that's going on. Some of us, we got to just let it go. I don't care what the church did to me. I don't care what my husband did to me. I don't care about all, I'm going to just let it go. And I'm just going to let all of that go and just breathe in the fresh air of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, why don't you just come? Fill me. Baptize me. God, I don't know what that looks like. I'm, I'm scared of what that's going to do. I, I don't know what that means. I, I, speaking in tongues, I don't understand it. But God, I just want you. Holy Spirit, I just want you. I want your power. I want your fresh fire. Can that be our prayer? Can that just be what we want? Let's close our eyes, bow our heads. 
Next week, I'm going to explain how you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Next week, we will have an altar call. We're going to invite you to come and receive it. However, you don't have to wait till next week. If you're like, I want it today. I don't want to go another day. I don't want to go another week. Then by all means, at the end of this service, you come up here and we're going to pray with you. We will lead you through it. It's not mystical. It's not magical. It is just very much a prayer you pray and a gift you receive. It's not hard. It doesn't cost you anything. But I do today want just to give the Holy Spirit a moment to deal with us, to deal with our hearts. So we're just going to sit for a moment. I want you to be thinking about your relationship with the Holy, with Holy Spirit. Are you open to him? Have you received him? How do you feel about, are you afraid of him? Have you quenched him? Have you locked him out? Have you blocked him? Have you restricted his access into your life? He's got some parts, but not all parts. Are there concerns that you have concerning him? Let's get real. You get real with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray this prayer over all of us right now. Father, uh, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you bring to light? Would you bring it to our minds? Would you bring it to our, our natural mind, God, where we're at with you in this realm of the Holy Spirit? Would you, would you show us areas where maybe we've restricted his moving in our lives? Would you, would you bring to light areas that we don't trust? Areas that we've shut them out. God, for those who have never really experienced the Holy Spirit at all, would you, just, would you just begin to prepare our hearts, our minds, our souls, our bodies to receive this gift that you want to give us? There are people here today who just need to apologize to Holy Spirit. You just need to apologize and say, I'm sorry that I've just kind of left your side kind of just not paid attention to you he wants to bring you back it's our lifeline it's our power source to living a godly life thank you Jesus okay let's all stand to our feet we're going to get ready to go today but I do I want you to be I, you're going to leave here and you're going to go on about your life, but I, I, I'm going to, I'm praying this week and I want you to join with me in prayer. I want prayer partners to be praying this all week, that the Holy Spirit would be on our minds. The Holy Spirit would be in our thoughts and it would be in our prayers and it would be just like, you know, when you're just laying there, it, that he would just bring himself into our remembrance and that he'd be dealing with us and he'd be preparing our hearts so that next week as we wrap up this series, as we Give the invitation for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit next Sunday that you're prepared in all the different ways. And he understands your concerns and he understands your timidity and he understands your, your you know, hesitation. I'm telling you, friends, the Holy Spirit is our best advocate, our best resource. You think you need more money and I would say you need more Holy Spirit. You think you need more patience? You need more Holy Spirit. You need more love? You need more Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the answer to it all. Amen? Can you receive that? All right? Talk about it. Ask questions. At, talk amongst yourselves. Hey, what's your experience with the Holy Spirit? Go up to Ellen and Janice and say, do you guys speak in tongues? And then what difference did that make in your life? Like, ask them that question. They can handle it. Right? And they'll correct all the things I got wrong. <laughs> they'll say, well, she said this, but it's really like this. And, you know, then they'll set it straight. Right? Talk about it. Ask questions. Don't go to Google. Not just yet. Like, just don't go there. Like, maybe as you learn, go to the Bible. Just a thought. Just go to Scripture. But let God do a work. And you know what, friends? This is what, and, and those of you who grew up like I did in Pentecost, would you, this is my prayer. Holy Spirit, pour yourself out. Flood our churches, flood our people, flood our cities. But God, let it be you. 
and let it be authentic and let it be real and don't let me and my misconceptions and my perspective and my experience of old in any way impact, influence, hinder, downplay or reject the new move of God that you want to do. Amen. I want an authentic, powerful move of the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to be a negative person just because I'm like, you know, I don't want to go crazy. No, I want, I want all of God. All of God in his way. The real thing. Amen. Amen. Will you join me in those prayers? All right, we're going, I'm going to pray a prayer of dismissal. You are going to go get your kids, and then you can have a snow cone. Even you guys can have snow cones. It's not just for the kids, all right? So who doesn't love a snow cone? So get a snow cone after church, and uh, it will be good. And uh, we'll see you Wednesday. No, <laughs> some of you will see next Sunday. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. God, we thank you for your church and what a blessing it is in our lives. God, I pray that as we leave this place, we would be reminded, we would be aware, we would be attentive to your Holy Spirit and what you are doing, what you want to do. And uh, Father, that we would have open hearts, open minds, open ears to receive from your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that it wouldn't just be something that we just in our head, but God, there would be a supernatural, undefinable move of your spirit in our lives. God, that there would be no doubt that it was you. And I just pray, God, as we open ourselves and we make ourselves available to you and we give you permission to move in our lives, Lord, that you would do something so supernatural, so divine, so, so miraculous, God, that it would prove to us without a shadow of doubt that you truly are powerful and supernatural and all of those things. So God, would you move in that way? And I just pray that that would happen this week and our hearts would be ready and prepared for next week. God, we love you. We praise you. Bless your people. Bless those kiddos down in kids' church and, and all of our toddlers and preschoolers. God, would you just keep your hand on us, our families, that we would be blessed everywhere we go, going in and going out. Father, we love you and we praise you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a good week, you guys.